Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? This is very tall, so I'm, I'm not a bit of a... Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Ginny Lee. I'm the Associate Dean Engagement of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. And I'd like to really invite you all to our MSD Agenda Lecture, um, <laughs> which uh, is uh, it's very exciting for us to have John Thacker here. But I'm not here particularly to introduce him. I'm here to introduce Rory Hyde, who will be introducing him. But first of all, I'd like to begin the proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people, um, and pay respects to their elders and families past and present. Now I'd like to introduce Rory Hyde, who could stand up while I'm doing it. He works across architecture, design, research, broadcasting and building. He's a multi-talented person. Probably too much. Is that too much? Yeah, don't, let just do the... Uh, Can I do... The part last sentence. The last bit? Yeah. Okay, so you don't want to know that he studied architecture. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he's the co-host of The Architects, a weekly radio show on architecture, and teaches design thesis in the Masters of Architecture program here at the University of Melbourne. His first book, Future Practice, Conversations from the Edge of Architecture, is proving very popular around this town and elsewhere. So, and it's due to Rory and his connections and uh, support for us that we have John Packer here tonight. So, Rory. Thanks, Jenny. Um, thanks everybody for coming and thanks to Ginny and Alan for uh, helping pull this together and to get John here. Um, I've got a bit of an intro, um, which is, starts with a conference that I was at on Saturday, hosted by the Associated Schools of Architecture in Australasia, um, looking at how we rethink the teaching of architecture. And um, there seemed to be a distinction evolving between, well, architecture as we might uh, once have defined it, um, about designing buildings, a fairly uncontroversial idea, um, and then architecture as being about the world or about our practice engaging with the world in a, in a direct way. Um, and the kinds of challenges that we might encounter through our work. So these challenges might include uh, natural disasters, sea level rise, post-earthquake reconstruction, post-conflict work in Belfast, Berlin, Palestine, uh, dealing with unfamiliar typologies such as data centres or how learning spaces are affected by pervasive Wi-Fi. Um, in, I could go on and on, post-oil exurbs, instant cities in China and the Middle East. What we do has become radically different as we engage with this complex world today. Um, so these two positions, um, architecture on the one hand um, and the world on the other, were at this conference set up as a kind of binary, so we have to make a choice uh, between them. On the one hand, we can put our heads down keep working hard, uh, bringing together forms in light with perfect detailing and professional competence. Um, and on the other hand, we might well embrace these challenges directly um, that are facing our planet and reinvent what we do. And I guess the implication here is that by choosing the second path, we somehow neglect architecture. and We put the foundation of the profession at risk. Um, and that by expanding the boundaries of the discipline, it suddenly becomes too diffuse, too vague, and we potentially can lose the lot. Um, I would argue that that's a false dichotomy. Um, and the only way we can reclaim social relevance in architecture and in the eyes of the public is to tackle these issues head on and create a new and authentic way of operating, which is driven by this context of complexity. Um, and that's why we're really lucky to have John Thackra here today. Uh, his book, In the Bubble, Designing in a Complex World, um, hugely influential on my thinking and um, uh, on many other people. He was just telling me it's been translated into 10 languages, so it's a sort of uh, global bestseller. Um, it weaves together ethical, social, ecological and practical examples of how designers can forge a new kind of practice out of the challenges that the world is throwing at us. And I've got one quote here which I've underlined six times, which says that uh, as we suffuse the world with complex technical systems on top of the natural and social systems already here, old style, top down, outside in design simply won't work. 
The days of the celebrity solo designer are over. Complex systems are shaped by all the people who use them. And in this era of collaborative innovation, designers are having to evolve from being the traditional authors, the individual authors of objects or buildings, to being the facilitators of change among large groups of people. Um, that was published in 2005, so importantly it's before uh, the global financial crisis and all the soul searching that's come along with it. Um, so it's not a kind of opportunistic, oh we've run out of work, let's try and uh, look for new places to colonise. Um, it's much more fundamental than that and, and uh, positions itself in a much longer time span. Um, now, it's also important to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> I've still got John's extensive bio to get through. Um, and the, I guess the key thing to note here is that he's not an architect, um, but he, he's a lot of things and uh, he fits into this narrative of expanded practice and not seeing the world through the eyes of a discipline or in, one discipline in particular, but about drawing connections between all sorts of different ways of thinking. Um, so, for 30 years, John Thackra has travelled the world in his search of stories about the practical steps taken by communities to realise a sustainable future. He writes about these stories online and in books, and he uses them in talks for cities and business and organises events that bring the subjects of these stories together. John is the author of a widely read blog at designobserver.com and has 12 published books, including Design After Modernism, Beyond the Object, Lost in Space, A Traveller's Tale, and the best-selling In the Bubble, um, which has been, uh, yeah. <laughs> As director of doorsofperception.com, John has organised conferences and festivals at venues including the Pompidou Centre, Victoria and Albert Museum, Axis Gallery in Tokyo, in which social innovators share knowledge. Uh, he's lectured in more than 40 countries. A Brit who now lives in southern France, John studied philosophy and trained as a journalist before working for 10 years as a book and magazine editor. He was the first director in 1993 of the Netherlands Design Institute in Amsterdam. He was program director of designs of the time, the social innovation Biennale in England. He was commissioner in 2008 of France's main design Biennale Cité du Design. Uh, John is senior fellow of the Royal College of Art in London, where he's also director of research and a fellow of the Young Foundation, the UK Social Enterprise Incubator. He sits on the advisory boards of the Pixel 8 Festival in Helsinki, Future Perfect Festival in Sweden, and Design Impact in India. He's also a member of the UK Parliament's Standing Commission on Design. Please welcome John Thackeray. Actually, that was just an introduction to Rory's book, which I happen to have in my hand, which is terrific. Because insofar as I can summarize that story, it's that I'm trained as a writer and was bullied by various uh, editors over the years to look for two things. One is, what is the story? And who is the person at the center of this story? And uh, that's what's terrific about this book, if you haven't read it, because it's about people who are like us, searching for not concepts, not strategies, not uh, ideologies, but trying to make sense of what's happening in the world through the actions of people in many different contexts responding to these very complicated events that we're all aware of, if nobody, certainly me, is particularly clear about. Um, and I want to say I'm very happy to be here in Australia, but I am pretty confused. I started off in Perth a couple of days ago, and I was just mystified to encounter a city in which um, they sell entire buildings through ATMs. <laughs> so the city of Perth, I don't know if any of you have been to the central business district uh, recently, is like, for me probably one of the most extreme places on earth where you see energy capital kind of landed as if from space but not quite hitting the ground. So you have this cluster of tall, featureless, grey, reflective buildings all of them done in the last period of time. None of the buildings has the name of the organization on it, except occasionally on the top. None of them has any form of social cafe or activity in it, except for one. Um, it's a complete mystery land in the middle of a kind of rather long way away from the rest of this country, never mind the rest of the world. But it's a kind of fantastic metaphor for one part of the complicated world that we find ourselves in, namely, um, where the globalization of energy and money, which in many respects are the same thing, are causing 
all sorts of strange stresses and strains in the fabric of daily life and the fabric of imagined life. That was Perth. In Perth, though, I discovered I could see, and I talked to a whole lot of people, not one single sign or piece of evidence of the basic material flow which caused this money and this energy enterprise to land from outer space, namely the mining that takes place elsewhere in the state. Um, not one single side of it. So you could, I found online, and I've been many years ago, I've traveled through the northern parts of Western Australia, but there was not a single sort of suggestion, not one speck of the red dust that is caused by this gigantic industry. Um, and it was only when I, I came here for Hong Kong that, uh, where I was told that uh, actually 80% of the value of this mining that takes place invisibly to those standing in Perth is in uh, for the Chinese manufacturing uh, system. And so that's Zaha Hadid's new design school. It's another lecture I'll not give now, but about the weird excretion of extraordinary design schools around the world. In that building, just by way of contextualization, all the Chinese delegates at a conference I was at said, there's going to be a crash, two to three years maximum. Um, lots of anecdotes, but the most striking one I remember is that there are as many empty apartments in Beijing as there are in the whole of the United States, which is not, for me anyway, a widely known fact. So you have these massive buildings in Perth attached to and the expression of extraordinary flows of capital and investment over a period predicated on the continuation of an economy which is about to go pop. And you think, what a strange world we live in. Which is why when uh, we talk about what the kind of tasks for a profession are, I'm always surprised, but it's my job as a kind of edge traveler, to say, well, let's not try and think about how to design cities until we look at the kind of the flows and the changes that are about to engulf us, or actually, in many respects, already have engulfed us. So my first provocation is to say, please, can we stop talking about cities as things that we build in a kind of rational, calm manner, not to mention buildings. Um, secondly, uh, takeaway number two, let's uh, look at the many, many examples in which people, as I said at the beginning, are exploring new ways to live on the planet, to meet daily life needs, but using social and um, natural energy rather than capital and resource-based energy. And thirdly, how does one actually do number B? Supposing that we agree, for the sake of this evening, that social innovation as a way of greening cities and more importantly rendering our lives sustainable is an important part of the picture. How do we do it and what has it got to do with what was traditionally known as a design practice? So why do we have to, or why am I suggesting or asking or praying that we stop talking about cities in the abstract? Well it goes back, I want to just go to a short history of the, my self-education with my community of uh, advisors and fellow searchers into the general intersection between the modern uh, technological and the fi indeed financial changes that preoccupy us so much and the less obvious environmental agenda. So it's firstly in 1995 that we did a conference at, uh, in Amsterdam called Info Eco, where we posed the question, <coughs> well, modernization, information technology, the internet, Everybody keeps saying they're going to reorganize the world and reality will never be the same again. What does this revolution in the kind of material world made by man and women mean for the environmental agenda that we keep being told is so pressing? And I would like to say that I don't think at that moment became clear, but actually what happened in 1995 and pretty much ever since is those two worlds kind of looked at each other with a degree of fear and distaste. So the the kind of persons in the black t-shirts from the internet world looked at the persons in the sandals from the environmental world and said, oh my god, not one of those, and vice versa. We went through the years, actually after that moment, asking a question, if there are aspects of in the industrial economy, the thermo-industrial economy, that are destroying the biosphere, can we as active and um, motivated agents in some way change the way that the, the kind of system is organized and 
wired up and piped together. So we looked in 2002 at the flow issue in an urban, in a bi-regional, in, in a bigger context. And we had a fantastically rich um, education in the, the existence of flows, for example, of resources invisibly in and out of cities. But nobody came up with a terribly plausible explanation as to what we were supposed to do about it. By 2005, we'd gone to India to organize our events and our conferences there, where we sat in um, Bangalore, in this case, observing the just mind-boggling flow of people and information and money and urban change swirling around our heads. And we said, if, as seems to be the case, this form of habitation is unsustainable in all sorts of different ways, what kind of infrastructure could we imagine and make that would render this extraordinary urban explosion more sustainable than it is now. Again, a very fascinating and exciting discussion, but not one single clear story emerged from that conference with all sorts of different people in India about what it was that we needed to reimagine about this word infrastructure. Then we went back two years later and looked at the subject of uh, food, food systems, nutrition, the flows of nutrition in and out of cities, in and out of the body. Wonderful conference. We spent time at rivers looking at pollution. We spent time in Sikh temples observing how they feed 10,000 people on donated food. We observed a whole lot of extraordinary responses to food precarity that uh, India has known for a very long time, to, only to discover that there wasn't anything very obvious by way of a model or a system or even a kind of mindset that one could imagine picking up from India and bringing back uh, to Europe or to the north. And the one thing that changed things for me and for the people that I uh, work with and have influenced me over the years was visiting an old growth forest in, in this case in Nova Scotia, where for the first time I was able to experience physically as well as intellectually the notion of organic growth that operates on very, very long time periods. And at that moment realized two things. One is that looking for solutions if with a design mind, or even for that matter with a design mind, okay, we have a crisis of sustainability, we must find an answer. The language of solutions is the wrong way to think about it. There are certain things to which there are no solutions, thermal, uh, thermo industrial economy being one of them. You can't fix it. It has to be replaced, and or it will replace us. And the second thing was that the notion of the built and the made and the handmade that I throughout my life as a writer about design and surrounded by designers and urbanists and scientists of every conceivable hue, we made the mistake of uh, just behaving like everybody else and imagining ourselves to be outside the world of living systems rather than um, co-dependent within it. In other words, unless we learned that trees were one of us rather than something to put um, on a slide, we were going to make no progress in imagining what it means to adapt to the pressures that are on upon us. And then I went through a brief phase of deciding to be a fire and brimstone preacher like Wendell Berry. Um, I think I've grown out of that, but I love this one. The cities have forgot the earth and will rot at heart until they remember it again. So this is the kind of the fire and brimstone bit of my story about let's not talk about cities because cities do not exist in isolation. We as humans do not exist in isolation. We are part of a complexity of living systems upon which we are all depend. Until we make that shift in our mental and embodied thinking, we're not going to make much progress. And I told you about the 15 years of conferences where we sat in rooms like this and talked about it. To this day, this is still going on. So that picture in the middle there is of a festival I went to 10 days ago in Amsterdam, where they had brought together all the cool urban projects in the city of Amsterdam on everything from urban farming to the shared ride share and so on and so forth. But at no point was the location of these projects put into a kind of bigger 
framework of the footprint of that city in terms of its resource flows, where the food comes from, where does the energy come from, what are the ecosystems upon which Amsterdam is sitting, and so on. That was missing from the imagination uh, of the concept of the event and from therefore from the kind of discussions that we had about all the individual projects. And it's what Karl Marx called a long time ago the metabolic <coughs> rift, the notion that we are just separated in our imaginations and in our practices and in our social organization, in our cultural attitudes from this reality of having a, a metabolic context. And every year as the kind of mediatization increases, as the, the sort of layers of mediation become more complex, the metabolic rift widens. So as far as I'm concerned, the tasks of thinking about cities in terms of how to reconnect them with um, their metabolic and their natural context is the way to frame how we think about and how we engage with what is happening on the ground with human beings in terms of social energy. But this is where I remain an optimistic person because once through this, I hope not too confusing journey that people like me have made away from thinking that there is some kind of puzzle that can be solved like Sudoku or the, you know, like a jigsaw, if rather it's about thinking differently, then at least with that um, filter in place, I encounter a gigantic number of extraordinarily um, exciting and innovative and just plain happy making examples of where people without any knowledge of the words that I've been using are responding to these kind of ineffable pressures by doing things in new ways. And this is what I describe as social in energy, social innovation, people doing stuff in response to local contexts in ways that others can call innovative, but they regard as saying, yeah, that's what does the job. So just to, I'm going to show you at random uh, a few examples. So last week I was in Nantes in France at a conference on eco-cities. You must have them here. I'm, I'm not sure that you even haven't. Have you had eco-cities in Melbourne? I think you might have done. Yeah. It's a kind of large and growing conference and trade fair on all things cities and eco. Just terribly depressing because they've managed to recreate the look and feel of an old style trade fair, but with the word eco-cities badged on top of it. So everybody was feeling extraordinary. I was feeling tired and miserable until one moment when somebody from Germany had organized something called Disco Soup. And Disco Soup was when we got the hell out of this grim convention center and into a disused part of the city in the railway yards and in a bizarre but wonderful um, experience. 150 people were given the task of chopping up vegetables for the most part that had been extracted from the wasted food of the city of Nantes and with incredibly loud disco music blaring in the background, chopped up the food and made soup for 5,000 people. And so that's the story, that is it. But people became happy. The people who'd been giving rather tedious lectures, including me, about food flows and the kind of food system and the waste of food, it finally became clear that this subject could actually generate positive energy and fun, as well as anxiety and deep and um, tortuous thought. Then two weeks ago, I was in Rotterdam where, I don't know, I'm sure many of you are involved in urban farming, either doing it or knowing about it. I just saw an example of what happens when a series of small urban projects that have begun by activists and enthusiastic but kind of relatively resource poor people, when something starts to achieve critical mass. Now, Rotterdam, as you may or may not know, is a pretty tough uh, port city. Uh, it's not at all a place filled with hippies and uh, green people. It has some sort of people who call themselves green architects, but that's a slightly separate subject. What it does have is a kind of strong sense of social solidarity born of the kind of brutality of the port economy. And in that situation, the activists, the woman called Deborah Solomon here, who have spent five years developing the organization to grow food in disused parts of the city, when you see the kind of maturity of the garden combined with the maturity of the social organization, it's just wonderful to, uh, to be part of. Not that this is going to be the alternative by itself to the 
agricultural system of the planet, just that it's an example of what happens when social organization matures enough to get results and um, food, actually, uh, more than were expected when they started. Zurich, it's filled with gold dealers and all sorts of very weird commodity broking, sky rise buildings, not to mention uh, lots of money. But Zurich, like every other city on the planet, has its dark side, its poor side, its absolutely not at all immune from this. Can you, is this building isn't going to fall down, is it? I'm just, it's a dance rehearsal. Dance rehearsal. You see, that's what I mean. We should be up there dancing anyway. <laughs> the, I will not be offended if anybody wants to go and dance upstairs. It's a better way to live. Okay, so in Zurich, just by way of a statement, all cities are stressed, all cities have an underclass, all cities have unemployed people. Zupan and Badala, these guys have said, well, we ha why not find the food that's thrown away, turn it into soup, and deliver it around the city on a bicycle. So that's social innovation, green food flows, etc., etc. It's just there because it's Zurich, an unlikely place to find such things. In Lapland, which is a pretty hostile climate, but has a rather sparsely populated and contains a small number of uh, independently minded people and large numbers of absolutely voracious and pretty kind of evil forestry enterprises, there are signs of social organization around food, about mobility, around other stuff. So this is a disused um, urban building turned into a cafe, a food hub, a training center, and a whole bunch of other things beside. It doesn't have the word hub in its title. It doesn't kind of have a social innovation agenda, but it has become one of those things in response to the precariousness of the situation there. Brazil, you probably know that Brazil has an incredible amount of stuff but the, uh, happening. What is what I didn't know until I went there was that the favelas are extraordinarily sort of proactive in looking for new ways to share resources and to create service platforms to help people not just kind of get food and live um, sustainably, but also to begin to undo some of the damage that's been done to the natural systems upon which they are but. So this is Brasilandia, right next to and on top of a whole pile of tropical rainforest that it has been kind of eating into and polluting for 20 years. Now the people of that favela, the so-called poor and irresponsible people, are looking for ways to regenerate the, the river systems, the plant systems, and to render their favela more supportive and less damaging to the natural systems upon which they know now that they depend. Norfolk, North Wales, incredible stories there about a place which is the breadbasket or was the breadbasket of, of Great Britain, a kind of agricultural area. At some point, people plonked a couple of nuclear power stations down and thought uh, that'll keep um, Britain lit, then thought they were going to kind of renew the power stations, then the crisis of nuclear. You have this amazing, con you know, the people, two things sitting next to each other of the kind of the European nuclear industry at its most venal next to the, um, the alternatives of the agroecological community, permaculture, small scale production. The point being that the, it's just, it's a very unusual situation, but there is so much activity on the ground of people who are saying, we don't want to work in a nuclear power station. We do not accept the argument that this is the only place to get proper jobs. I'm telling you about North Wales because it's, nobody knows much about it. It's just incredibly culturally rich. And the Druids have as much cultural resonance there as do the atomic scientists. Although I must say, I did slightly mess things up for my career because I thought I was going to get um, an ongoing job there until I discovered that the Vice Chancellor of Bangor University is an uh, atomic physicist himself. So he wasn't impressed by my stories of druids and uh, the like, whatever. Sweden, Lyon, France has a reputation as being uh, capable of extremes, but the, what is, I think, amazing in France, they have two million associations in France. They have the word called la vie associative, the associative life in which it is regarded, but invisibly to me as a foreigner until recently, as obvious that, of course, citizens will organize to take control of and improve aspects of their daily lives on many, many aspects. Um, this is in Lyon, where they, for like six or seven years, have been reclaiming great chunks of the city center for 
productive use long before anybody even invented the word urban farming or became fashionable in the general sense of the word in a kind of aesthetic as well as a cultural and lifestyle response. It was unpleasing to the people of Lyon to see uh, car parks where there could be a garden. So Emmanuel Louis Grand, who's the creator of this space, um, did not find it difficult to mobilize members of the community to get involved with that. I have a whole story about sustainable transport, but that's just, some of you know Ezio Manzini. Then we all had to get into that coracle. This is the coracle. So this is all about mixed mode transport, but I'm running a tiny bit over schedule, so I'll jump over that and that. Um, but to come on to this notion of remaking the city in accordance with the wishes and the ideals of sustainability is at the moment, I showed you at the beginning the Disco Soup and the Eco Cities conference. That conference was filled with big utility companies who have determined that they are green just by inserting the word green for the most part, I'm exaggerating a bit, but there's a perception that all the cities in the world will have to transform themselves into sustainable cities. They will need, in one way or another, to be resilient to climate change and to all sorts of difficulties, and that, therefore, of course, gigantic amounts of money should be handed over to consulting companies and to infrastructure and utility companies to do that work. Uh, in the US alone, uh, McKinsey has said it's $21 trillion of work needs to be done to green the infrastructure. Now, the news that I have for them, and not for the mayors know it pretty well, but certainly for the, the industrial interests who think that this is the biggest thing since the last war in terms of making a lot of money, infrastructure is not going to be green by massive capital intensive projects, infrastructure will be greened by massive amounts of social activity with some technology and a huge amount of what they call sweat equity. How do I know that? Because it's already started. This is in Tucson. One of my heroes in the world is the Watershed Management Group. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's basically a kind of a completely new kind of organization that started in the southern cities of the US where they have climate stress, climate uh, drama, you wouldn't believe, like here during your drought, but more extreme. To, but the penny has dropped there in a way that I don't think it has here, that if we wait for the government, whether the federal or the state or the city government, to green our streets, to transform our drainage systems, to, take, to install off-grid um, systems, we will, will be waiting a long time. We have to do it ourselves. And so the um, Watershed Management Group has invented a model of work gang in which volunteers, citizens from each street, for the most part volunteering time with a small number of experts, street by street, house by house, dig up roads to make sustainable, a sustainable urban drainage at a street level. They physically fit handmade rain tanks. They retrofit and reorganize the plumbing systems for the gray water and so on. They do this because they see that it adds quality and um, utility to their neighborhoods, not because they're motivated to be green and to be modern and light, but because that improves their capacity to withstand the uh, climate challenges that they are already experiencing. In Greenland, likewise, yes, they have a, the potential for some kind of uh, growing friendly climate, but they also have a whole lot of US bases and other military infrastructures that they've very found very convenient to uh, change their use. Uh, back to Lapland, I got this out of sequence, Rovaniemi. I know that you have in here and in the US networks of um, new kinds of bakery cooperatives networked citywide. In Lapland, it's pretty advanced. They have a whole kind of infrastructure of kind of what they call a kind of wheat shed in which all the different bits of bread the, the millers, the growers, the shops, the cooks, the students collaborate together to ensure that there's some kind of livelihood for people involved in making real good bread. This is another one in the, the, um, the yes, yeah, Arismendi Co-op. I can never say that word in the Bay Area. It's a traditional co-op, but using the kind of geography of um, a large watershed to organize different bits of bread horizontally rather than in other aspects. This is in Chongqing where they use plants to clean the water and where they eat the top of the plants and which is a very old discipline, it's a sort of subject known in China 
not known to me anyway, anywhere else, but it's a fantastic example of social knowledge, culturally embedded knowledge that could be transferable. Beekeepers in Brooklyn, pollinator pathways. Do you know about this project, the pollinator path? I know you have a lot of amazing greening of Melbourne projects happening, but this is, I'm, I'm very fond of this one. It's not the only one in the world, but it's one of the pioneers. Oh my God, the bees are in trouble. Oh my God, there are no more butterflies. Habitat change has wiped them out, their migratory patterns, etc. There's a lot of understanding about why it is that the bees are in trouble and why it is that the butterflies are in trouble. But uh, the organizers of this, basically an artist in Seattle, said, well, what actually is needed for um, the city to be less of an obstacle to the migratory patterns of, uh, of butterflies or the behavior of bees and so on? Answer, plots not too far another, containing the flowers that they would otherwise normally expect to find. So I don't know if you can see that along the top. The first of the pollen, oh yeah, anyway, whatever. Those little dots are plots of land, either people's gardens or bits of disused land that somebody specially with special knowledge has figured out that those bits of land need, uh, contain the plants that bees need or pollinating uh, and insects need of the right kind and they're not too far apart, etc., etc. Zero capital spending by the city. I think it's pretty much 90% volunteer work. But a model for rendering cities um, more convivial to pollination that is based entirely on volunteer work and social enterprise and just sheer commitment and passion. And to draw to a close on my kind of gallop through the things that make me cheerful, Perth was just a nightmare in terms of cars. It's pretty bad here, but I've never, you know, it's worse than Los Angeles, the actual degree to which that city has been just fashioned to be car dependent. And one of the reasons that all those kind of buildings were utterly deserted at five minutes past five is that people leap into SUVs and jump, drive off, you know, one or two hours in the middle of Western Australia to f exurbs of one kind or another. And they didn't believe me when I said that the situation in California was changing. They just thought, no, 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 it's impossible. It will never change. In California, it is changing. It's changing quite quickly. Because, not because of somebody thinking, changing the concept of the city or the concept of the suburb, because a generation of people, principally under 35, just do not want the hassle and indignity of owning cars anymore. They just simply, I, this is not a scientific description of a cultural change, but there's the people that I've talked to over the last couple of years, certainly in the Bay Area, they say, nah, we don't, we don't, it's not cool to have a car, simply. It's not cool, but it's also not inconvenient because of all the new ride-sharing platforms that have emerged second, third, fourth generation. So Uber, if you probably, if you haven't heard of Uber, Uber is I think third generation. You stand by the side of the road, you press a button on your phone, and the system says to other people driving around who are earning a bit of money by giving people lifts, can you take me from the where he is to place that I've indicated on the phone? Maybe, I'll do that for 15 bucks. The phone says, okay, if the system will do it for 15 bucks, I press accept, car comes to me, takes me to my destination, and the 15 bucks is taken from my bank account or credit card to that driver's, but no cash changes hands. So, it's extremely simple, but it's one of those things that uh, uses resources in a dramatically more efficient way, but is driven by a cultural change, not by some fancy piece of infrastructure. But just by way of an example of what I mean about infrastructure being social and um, or, you know, policy based rather than capital based. Last week, after two years of fights between the car share schemes like Rideshare and Uber, the law was changed against the interests of the taxi companies and various private car based interests to say that ride sharing, yes, was an accepted and indeed a prioritized form of public transport infrastructure for the Bay Area which, yes, it's advanced and not typical of the rest of the world, but this, I think, is one of those tipping points in which notions of sh sharing resources such as cars that have been discussed for two or three decades suddenly become normalized and massive. And I think it's going to absolutely change the whole way that they think about transportation. Just, I've got one more example here. This is in Amsterdam. So the thing I'm talking about is when people become motivated to change their physical environment in an urban context 
not for reasons of ideology, but for reasons of opportunity and common sense and sheer fun. This is the studio of a group in Amsterdam called Metabolic, who are physically building an off-grid grey water system for a neighbourhood of Amsterdam. You can see it almost from the Amsterdam Central Station, in which, to cut a long story short, the cost per unit of families that they, when they make it themselves with fan materials, everything from recycled rain barrels to Arduino software, is 8,000 euros per street, so to speak, compared to 160,000 euros if it were done by Veolia or one of the big utilities. A huge difference in cost because, because of the participation, firstly, of citizens doing some of the physical work, but mainly because the complexity and the simplicity has been, from the bottom up, radically easier to imagine. I'm going to just... My favourite example, Mud Baron. Anybody heard of Mud Baron? He's in charge of 400 schools in Los Angeles which are turning themselves into productive urban schools. And the way he does it is he goes and finds some guilty film star, or in this case starlet, to come and do something to do with growing food and then shame or otherwise just um, yeah, persuade the school, the school board, the parents and all those people. Yes, of course we must have a school garden. So this is where the power of celebrity is um, not unimportant. That's another story. So I galloped through a bunch of stories about the notion that social energy is everywhere. It's not something that has to be conjured up. It's not a kind of task for a tremendous, if we can all do this together like in a war, it is imminent in every street of the world in different ways. And therefore, from the point of view of design, urbanism, architecture and strategy, the question for me changes rather profoundly away from what shall we build here to what is happening here and how can we help it do better. I actually think along with the chief architect of the Holland. Did you read about him saying we've, we don't need any more buildings? Did you see that last week, Rob van Dongen? The stats architect of the Netherlands, which is the most highly built country in the world, said last week, no more new buildings. It's the wrong task for us to do as architects. Um, but how? So how, if you, for the sake of this evening, agree with my proposition that there's a gigantic amount of not just attitudes changing, but people physically changing the built environment around them, their gardens, their water, their water systems, their transport. If that is a source of enormous potential, what can we do as professionals with a skill set and a history and a network and a, and a package of competencies, what can we do to help that grow and amplify? This picture, uh, this was uh, in Perth, no, in Fremantle, three days ago at a disused department store of Myers, from all over the country. It's just abandoned, it can't make it pay, and the building has been sold to a developer, or it's kind of a developer. And uh, a group of people have persuaded the developer and the city of Frio to, uh, let's see if we can repurpose this shopping center, this department store, with 40,000 square meters of space. Uh, to be a different kind of engine for the revitalization and the reimagination of the city. So the reason I'm showing this, apart from the fact that it's an unbelievably cool, it's the world's largest pop-up anything. Um, it, and I, I had this discussion, we started it there and we're carrying it on now. Supposing that a kind of empty department store is a kind of metaphor, real or otherwise, of a city that is intending to imagine itself, what could one imagine putting into that department store by way of activities that are transformative or uh, amplificatory of the trends that I've been talking about? Uh, so it's 40,000 square meters, and that's, that is a picture from last week. They're going to open it next week, so they've done from naught to nine weeks. This is uh, space makers. I think they're from here, actually. Are space makers from Melbourne? Whatever. You can all just look up my M Y R E. They had to change the name because of the copyright thing. Look up Maya Frio, Fremantle. You'll find out all about it. Uh, so the question is, using that as an example, and I don't know whether you have an, an empty Myers here, but if you have a, you have lots of empty buildings. They're everywhere, and there'll be more soon. What can one do with the spaces, not so to speak as things you then sell to somebody or rent to somebody, but as 
placeholders for the activities that will transform the city using social energy? That's my question. And this is where I will just show you what I think and I observe people doing some of the, my, my sort of network is dying right now today under this category of transformative activities that are not based on building things, but which for the most part are design activities in one way or another. The first is searching for talent, searching for the people doing cool stuff about whatever, food, childcare, dementia. This is a new Amsterdam market in New York, which is, yes, it's a kind of rather prosperous area, well, to put it mildly, but it's now become a kind of de facto university of urban farming and urban food systems, simply because it's the place where everybody goes to find out what's happening with the latest projects on growing food on roofs, opening kitchens to teach people uh, how to make kimchi out of uh, whatever. There are dozens of experiments being done there, which are, all in one way or another, forms of knowledge sharing and training. You can go on a course. A friend of mine makes um, Danish rye bread in this market and teaches people how to make the Danish sandwiches. It's a niche, but she makes a good living out of it. In other words, the searching for the talent and the looking for experiments that can be amplified and helped is not like about going online and doing a search. It's like about going into the city and looking to see what is happening. You've got lots of markets here. I met some great students this morning who are doing a project on a market, and uh, it's a very rich source of ideas about what's happening now, what used to be there, what could be brought back, etc., etc. You get the story. Second thing, once you've found these experiments, don't just kind of have them in your head, bring them together. Find the 50 most interesting social pioneers from your area, whatever that area might be, and put them in a shed and let them talk to each other. This is what uh, I did with some friends in France in, a couple of years ago in Saint-Étienne, which is a former mining, former coal, former devastated city. And the question we gave ourselves, let's look for 50 projects in a 50 kilometer radius and put them in a shed. And that shed is a 5,000 square meter shed in which the design task was firstly to find the cool projects, secondly, uh, to help these people tell their story, and thirdly, to make sure that the policymakers and the journalists and the citizens came along to look and marvel at what was happening under their noses, for the most part, unbeknownst to them. So this is completely true. We had the senator, we had the kind of governors, we had the city managers came all to this show and said, who are all these people? And we said, sir, they're your, they're your citizens. They're doing these amazing projects right uh, in your uh, backyard. And by the way, they are your future. What can you do to help them? And there followed all sorts of discussions about that exact question in a very sort of pleasant and convivial atmosphere. It was not about experts telling either the citizens or the mayor or anybody else what to do. We basically, as the kind of curators of this experience, brought the 50 projects together and then they talked for themselves to the, their fellow project leaders, to the politicians, to the journalists, to the citizens. They did the talking and actually in this case, these are, this is a three-person bicycle courier company they actually ran their business from the show for two weeks. They just moved it, which is basically a mobile phone and some bicycles. They just transposed it, put it in the show, went off and did jobs. And every time they come back, they had a new piece of information to give to the head of transport or the head of the post office or the head of TNT who are there. And say, by the way, here is what practically needs to be done to improve the capacity of people on bicycles to move goods around the city. And it was just a very rich experience, the richer in my opinion, because nobody was giving anybody else a lecture about it, they were doing it there and then. So the guy from TNT said, what about the hills? And so you had somebody from a like, global logistics company talking to a three-person bicycle courier company about what, how do you decide when to, what goes up hills? Anyway, so just fantastic. And people had such a, a lot of fun doing that. So you look for the stars, the social innovators, you let them tell their stories. You just make the connections that are kind of in a kind of conjunctural way that enables them to just be recognized and so on. The next phase is to be a bit more strategic in the sense of, is everybody here that needs to be talking to each other 
uh, to reshape this system on a bio-regional scale. And then this is, I hope, one of the few kind of abstract diagrams. But I'm so impressed by this. It's some people in, again, the US called Nourish, who've spent 15 years trying to understand what a food system looks like, not just from the point of view of making a cool graphic, but in order to be a sort of checklist of who needs to be involved in the discussion and the conversation on a continuous basis for the rest of time about how a food system is working well or badly. So uh, if you just look up Nourish Life, you can look at this in more leisure, but it's basically about farmers, about the biological system, either literally or representatives of its scientists, the economic actors, society, etc., etc. It's just horrendously complicated when you imagine that as a kind of to-do list or a kind of flow chart. If you, however, imagine it as the setting for a restaurant in which you're going to invite a whole bunch of people for lunch and you hope you can get a nice <coughs> mixture of people to talk, this is a tremendously handy kind of checklist for the place more. Have we got political people here? Have we got the people from the supermarkets here? What about the people from the Ministry of Agriculture? What about the you just have a kind of look at the kind of shape of an ecosystem, because food systems are ecosystems, and you don't say, how do I redesign it? You say, how do we get the people in it to come and start talking about ways to change it? And so, as a kind of, this is another group in, again, in the US called the Food Commons. It's, the Food Commons is an amazing piece of work, because these, again, these are third, fourth generation food activists who said, yeah, we know you can't feed the whole planet on growing basil on your um, bathroom, uh, whatever, but neither are we going to survive if we put our trust into industrialized systems. What is there about the kind of reconfiguration of the way that we use land and water and space that is going to move us beyond this impasse of just fighting about false opposites? So the Food Commons is a plan to rethink and reimagine and rediscuss and restructure all those different aspects of what happens in a food system over a 10 year period. So it's not a kind of, we'll do this in three months. Over 10 years, they're going to look at all those subjects and figure out how to reorganize them, re plug them in in ways that are 100% consistent with a regenerative regional economy. It looks far-fetched. I'm just describing what happens when people who have gone through the kind of pioneer phase, gone through the activist phase, gone through the let's kind of be nice to each other phase and said, OK, the next thing is to be serious strategically about a plan for the components of this system. But the connecting of the actors is not like a kind of, kind of very, very mystical experience. It's about getting people together in a shared place that is neutral and convivial and having well-organized and well-prepared conversations. This is from the French project, where you have in that picture uh, people from the bank, people from the supermarket, farmers, activists, uh, mycologists, uh, kimchi experts, whatever. They basically were facilitated, and we did coaching and kind of helping to have an open conversation about, OK, we disagree about a lot of things, but we don't disagree that we want our region to be healthy where can we perhaps agree to start and that is an ongoing conversation in one place and that's the kind of thing designing the context for those people to talk to each other that is the, the priority around the world never underestimate the power of lunch which i don't think to me is a controversial statement but you wouldn't believe how many conferences and events i go to with people not thinking about the quality of the making together of the food i mean to me it's like step one two and three so this is in uh, Saint Etienne, where we had food every day for six, seven thousand people, uh, made from ingredients only from within 50 kilometres, and most people talked endlessly about how this could be possible, and all sorts of things span out of it. But at what the bottom line was that one third of our entire biennial was devoted to lunch, something I'm especially proud of. Five more minutes, then I'll stop. Okay. Um, so there you have. The connector. You look for the stars, you find different ways to get people together so that they can start to kind of build the dialogue and the conversation and the trust. And then the third, third phase is to say, OK, well, if we're going to do things differently, we need tools and platforms and kind of you know, ways to do stuff in other ways. Let's start to bring in tool makers 
to help us do that. So this is another show where we said, how on earth do you describe a tool for sharing resources to a normal, sane person with a, who has a life? And um, this is basically what we did was to have empty cans with labels saying ride share, food share, place share, etc., etc. In other words, just labeling the existence of tools for sharing resources without going into any detail about how they worked. In fact, in this case, they were just empty tins. But it was a, a beautiful example of People know about tins of paint or tools, but then you don't have to tell them what they need to be in detail, just make them aware of their existence. One of the, one of the cans said, um, and asset transfer protocol. That's a kind of policy wonk's word, but all over the world there are people squatting and occupying unused buildings. Fine, very cool, pop up everything. The next phase is for cities and property owners and developers to start being a bit more serious about admitting that these things are never going to be used for their original purpose and that by vesting them into the legally into the communities and the, act of, the actions that have been squatting them, you can actually reshape the economic profile of a city with its physical assets. This is a British organization called the Ant Asset Transfer Unit. I guess you probably have one here, I don't know, but there. How do you legalize and formalize informal uh, settlements? You need platforms for sharing skills. Uh, the thing about uh, Fremantle is that it has an incredible history of things like shipbuilding and all the millions of different skills that existed around that subject, never mind everything else, and the port. But there was no sense in which the city was able to identify and make reuse of the skills that were in the hands and the bodies and the minds of the people of its own citizens. In other parts of the world, that is being addressed. So the trade school started in New York now, I think, in 60 or 70 cities. It's a simple volunteer basis. Do you have a skill that you would like to share? How to make a rope? How to make a web page? How to make a creme brulee? Yes. OK, come along. We'll, we will provide you with a space, and you can teach people how to make a rope or make a creme brulee. And you have transferred your skill from you to three other people. Uh, and then I forget what the kind of different forms of barter take place. But that is an incredibly powerful and liberating experience for all the people who do it. And the models can change, but it's something that, if you, to go back to what I was saying about the department store in Fremantle, that could easily have a whole floor devoted to that. Here's one in England called, how do I make a web page in which people just tell each other that for no money? And I think I'll probably stop on this, because this is, I just think it's pretty important to say that this notion of bringing this diverse people together who are socially active, who are environmentally committed, who are living in cities, but are just otherwise totally burned out and confused about what to do, it's absolutely an important design task to invent forms of engagement that take the pressure off, that give people a sense that uh, they're part of a process and not being told what to do. And I'm a complete fanatic about the Transition Towns movement as pioneers in this notion of designing ways to meet, designing ways to connect, designing ways for very, very heterogeneous groups of people to begin to discuss refashioning where they live. And one of the kind of principles of the transition movement's meetings is they don't just talk about stuff, they make stuff. And this was a, a I don't know if it's a game, something was happening in London last October. Um, where they said, okay, what would it mean to reimagine the high street of the future in a what was sustainable, that was part of the transformation that we're all kind of looking for but not knowing how to achieve? And it could just as easily have been that department store in Fremantle, but they said, let's just spend time constructing an exercise that does that for ordinary people. This is not for professionals, but there were a lot of design and other sorts of experts kind of in the background. So. Battersea Town Hall, let's do the outline of the high street, let's make a map of the high street with uh, spaces for potential buildings, let's make little charcoal pictures or activities that we would like to see in forms of activity, forms of encounter, forms of interaction, forms of exchange that in our imagined and wished for city we would find. 
let's kind of put all of those onto a board just so you have a long list of all the things that in a, an ideal perfect future high street you would find. Let's find what skills we have in our number. This, this particular event was 300 people. So everybody kind of stood around with uh, pieces of blackboard on which their skills were written. I can make rope. I can make creme brulee. I can facilitate a meeting, whatever. And then the groups, I'm missing a few stages out, composed themselves into enterprises, social enterprise task forces, and set out to physically build a presence for their activity in the, the imagined town. And off they went to build their high street. Uh, and I probably should emphasize, it's probably obvious, but this group contains civil servants, cabinet ministers, it could, you know, quote, ordinary people. It was a pretty unlikely event, and I know you're all like this. You, if, if you're right, you'll, you'll hate this hippie nonsense, but I just promise you it's a lot of fun. So just bear with me for three more minutes, and then the pain will be over. The point being, OK, just to go through the process, let's build a local currency print shop. Let's build a bicycle sharing training facility, whatever. After uh, another one and a half hours of building the buildings of the high street, everybody went to visit each other and say, OK, what do you do here? And then to have discussions about whether this was or not uh, thought to be a viable social enterprise. And the city became a city filled with activities and enterprises and things that had not been there three hours earlier. And that is to transition anywhere four hours into the exercise. And what a lot of fun it was too, I must say. Um, and it was all about experiencing the possible, but it was mainly about giving people the sense that they could make some difference, even if in a kind of artificial way in an afternoon. And then in a round circle, unlike the one that we're in tonight, there was a discussion of what did we learn from this experience? What are the kind of issues not resolved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point being that the design of how to meet, which is very powerful in that movement and all around the world where you get intentional communities, where you get people in stress, where you get conflict resolution happening, there are wise people who would address the subject of how to meet and how to connect and how to engage as the most important part of their work, rather than what the thing is that one has made. Uh, so that's just by way of staying um, on that topic. I did have a whole section on policy, but I think I've done my hour, haven't I, don't you think? Yeah? We can chat about it. Sure. Let's chat about it, yeah, because I can see a kind of hungry looking expressions that I am aware <laughs> that standing between people and the dinner is a bad and dangerous place. So I'll stop there and then please have a discussion. Yeah. John, I thought I'd ask about the, well, about you and about the sort of skill that you bring um, and to try and boil it down. Um, and I guess that comment that you made about Fremantle and the opportunities there to, for skill sharing and that it hadn't been identified. And it was also another comment you made when we were walking around this afternoon about, um, I was talking about the um, terrible apartments that we're building along Swanson Street and that, you know, that the, the um, international students that we stuff into these tiny dog boxes are getting fed up. And you said immediately, well, you talk to the developers because they're at, it's their stake to keep them there. And it just seemed like such a natural line to draw between these two things, an issue on the one hand and somebody, a potential stakeholder. Is that, your, is that the kind of contemporary skill to see that opportunity and to draw the line between the two things? Is that what you do? Uh, if you put it like that, then yes, of course, that's what I do, yes. No, what I, what I do is I, was, I studied philosophy, which I have no idea if I do that, but I was trained as a journalist and I was absolutely, as I said right at the beginning, I had a bullied interview by some pretty kind of tough people off newspapers that it, concepts are of interest to a few intellectuals, but stories about people dealing with difficulties are more engaging. So insofar as I had a training, that was that training to look for people responding to difficult situations and fix, figuring out how to fix them. And because I've kind of, by a series of complete accidents, been in the worlds of design and architectures and cities, I try to look for the people on the edge of the official picture or the edge of the kind of shiny picture or the edge of the kind of developer's portfolio and say, what is happening? 
outside the official picture where people are kind of up to facing uh, challenges directly and what are they doing because that's what I was just taught at an early age that's where the, the stories are really being made. The other thing that struck me is this massive um, disconnect between the, well, the, the energy and enthusiasm and activities that we're seeing on the ground, um, people developing um, you know, goods moving on bicycles, people developing these um, farms that actually have, have a real scale to them ultimately, and then the, the kind of policies that we're seeing on a, on a um, state or federal level, that there's this complete disconnect between the sort of community attitude and the, and the uh, political attitude. So for instance here we have this problem where this guy uh, Dennis Natlin and this other guy Tony Abbott want to spend eight billion dollars on a tunnel which is, goes where a road already is. Um, and I guess um, how, how do we convince those people that we ought to upgrade our cycle infrastructure so that we can share and we can um, you know, link things in a more sustainable way? Uh, Do we need to have in, a, in the case a of your disco? Uh, uh, <laughs> actually, this, and that is not a totally stupid thing to do because normally what happens is that you say to somebody in, in a kind of high position of authority that uh, really there are alternatives. And they say, I don't, it's, it, you're just dreaming, I don't care, it's, I want something that can be done. And what you said at the beginning of your comment about building things, that is at the heart of it because we have an economic system, but more importantly an institutional system which ranges from planners to economists to educators to whatever, a vast infrastructure of professional expertise that's developed over a long time that's all about building things. But every single time you see about, you know, how do we revive the economy, it's a sign of a revival if somebody wants to build a large thing somewhere. And they're, they're good and bad people involved in that, but it's because nobody's persuaded them that uh, other forms of creation are equally useful and desirable. Then you get people saying, well, we need metrics to prove that this social stuff is as worthwhile as building a nice new building. Uh, but then you get the kind of what they call the lock-in of institutional taxation regimes that uh, if you build a new building, you don't pay any taxes. Well, I'm not sure if it's stupid. In many countries, it's sort of tax-free compared to reusing an existing building. And you get higher margins. But the most important thing is that the financial system is predicated on the growth of new money going into building stuff, whether it be power stations or houses, and unless that part of the economy is growing, the whole edifice comes crumbling down. So the bad side of it is uh, you can't just make a kind of green thought and say, okay, we'll stop growing, because as a, just as an objective fact, the financial system will collapse if it doesn't grow. So therefore, all the stuff that I'm describing is partly a picture of a nice alternative, but it's mainly the preparations that the people are making for difficult times ahead mainly because for most of them the difficult times have already arrived. But it's, it's building stuff is just, you can't argue about it, it's locked into the system. Um, this idea that we, uh, we shouldn't build things or perhaps, or, or to quote you quoting Fritz van Dongen that there's no new buildings in Holland for instance, is a fairly uh, controversial thing to say in an architecture school. <laughs> well, no, he's the stats. I, I <laughs> think it's it, of course. <laughs> but he's a stats architect of yeah, Holland. Yeah. He's not even. He's not like. It's not particularly green. He's, just, he's observing that for his job. He wants. To, he's saying what you said at the beginning. How do we use our skills and our infrastructures and our culture to improve life for people without building large new buildings? Because that's what. He was just being a realist. I'm not saying it's the same here because I, you know, it's a different situation. But that's what he said about the Netherlands, which is the most man-made country in the world. So it's a yeah, and they do pretty have tens yeah. of thousands of vacant buildings. But I just a few. We've, we've yeah. got them here too. Um, and then I'm also going to play uh, devil's advocate, I guess, which is um, partly because I'm looking for good arguments myself to counter these types of questions. Um, but isn't sweat equity, uh, individuals having to green infrastructure, another s way of saying the big society, where we throw the um, obligations onto the people who are already stretched, already working hard, and that you need to look after your grandmother and you need to um, green the front strip and mow it? Um, you know, how, how do you counter those sorts of You don't mow, you eat it, actually, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, it totally sounds like the big society and it totally makes me sound like a right-wing, anti-welfare, anti-social solidarity person. 
And that's why I've sort of realised, and along with people in my world, that I'm sort of just not fitting into that political... I don't see myself as being right or left-wing in that sense of being against... I'm completely in, in favour of social solidarity, but I'm not actually in favour of bringing back jobs for people to wreck the biosphere. I don't see that as a step forward. We have to find livelihoods which may or may not be attached to jobs, which create value for not just for human beings, but for all living systems. And that's just a big ask. You know, you're kind of looking for the next thing after a very, very long period of human history, the last bit of it fueled by gigantic amounts of energy, and both of those things are now in question. So I have no idea at all what this new thing is. I'm just saying it's not jobs for the workers so they can build more cars. I mean, that's simply not, to me, a desirable step forward. I might just make one more comment before we open it up. Um, the thing that I found really compelling throughout your work is these, um, the design and um, enactment of these different scenarios for sharing ideas or for cre creating participation. Um, I mean, the lecture format that we're in at the moment, this kind of um, A to B hectoring with your <laughs> clicker, <laughs> live green, seems so um, limited. So I loved seeing these examples of, of um, lunches or of um, larger groups or of different, um, even different seating scenarios as a way of kind of getting past this. Um, but, but equally, that none of them are technological. It's not, uh, I mean, we know you're a writer and a blogger, but there, it's not a, you know, the internet has its limitations as well in how we share our ideas, seems to be another current threat. There, there, I've been 15 years just obsessed by the, the poverty of mediated communication, which I kind of, I think along with a lot of people, uh, felt rather than understood. And then I started to talk to everybody from to ethnographers who talk about indigenous forms of knowledge to neuroscientists who told me that the, the, the brain that we use to kind of have discussions and look at pictures is 5% of our total brain capacity and the other 95% is doing something else. So I've had a kind of an intuitive and a kind of rational understanding that those forms of discourse are limited. Um, and for me it is actually, and I met just two days ago in, uh, in uh, Perth, I met a child psychologist who runs a whole <coughs> network of centres for distressed children. And she said to me exactly the same thing, is that uh, we just, we, we measure the capacity of children to be effective in society by such narrow criteria that anybody who doesn't fit into them is you know, labelled as ill and then you give them drugs or, or, or therapies just because they don't fit into the, the patterns that we have imposed on them. Um, I can't remember what the question was, but I'm, yeah. No, different, I, ways yeah. Of, uh, different ways of looking and, and being in the world. And so, yeah, the stories that I've told are almost in, without exception things happening now rather than scenarios. So I think this whole subject of designers dreaming up alternative futures is kind of sound, and I've said it for much of my career, yes, it's very good. You must imagine alternatives, then people have something to look forward to or give you something to work towards. I just, I don't think I think that's true. I think we have to look, learn to see quality and value and potential in that which is there now and how to look after it and regenerate it and, you know, maybe re-look after it, but not dream up some alternative that... Uh, from that's having seen the Matrix 2 or something, and that that should be what the world will be like, and then we'll be all okay. I think utopias have a lot to answer for, and I, I try not to do that anymore. <laughs> all right, well, we might um, take some questions. Uh, up the back. Um, John, it's nice to hear if someone actually gets it. <laughs> I, I, if, I, if I said that, I probably suggested it, but it's not what I really think, because um, what I think is going to crash and burn is the, the most high entropy, resource-intensive parts of our world generally, including institutions, but not per se the kind of society will come to a sudden end. I'm very much guided by a man called John Michael Greer, who is a druid of all things, but he writes about, he's a very expert historian of how societies 
change. He doesn't use the word collapse. And he says that one can have very long periods of disorder and inconvenience and chaos that um, can last one or 200 years, at the end of which, miraculously, a civilization has disappeared and maybe a new one is beginning to appear. And he makes a rather good point that that's pretty much what our world is like now. I don't believe that all forms of government and institutions are only an obstacle. I think that, uh, in fact, I, my practical experience is that, say, quite a lot of people inside governments at all levels um, know perfectly well that things aren't going to carry on like this, but they don't feel empowered or they just don't quite know what to do. But I think that applies to most of us. We don't quite know what to do. And there are a lot of people beginning to write in a formal sense about the task of governments is not to do things or to control things, but to be the stewards or the enablers or the, the, uh, the, the clearer way of obstacles. So this whole thing in, uh, with the, the car share in, in California. So California, no, San Francisco and New York have got this formal agreement now about the sharing economy in which they say, well, we don't know what it means, but we as two major conurbations will now study and implement the measures that we can to make resource sharing easier for everybody. And starting with car sharing, ride sharing, but then there's going to be a you know, limitless list of things. So that's where governments have a very important and unavoidable role to play in reshaping the legislative framework or to, to, so that people can do their stuff from the, on the grassroots basis. Yeah, John, um, lots of take home messages, so that was great. I, one I got, um, which is in your response, was it seems like you're advocating that, that we should see the role of the designer as change maker should change from designer of outcomes to designer or facilitator of the process. Is that, is that partly what you're saying? Yes, if I, I, anything I advocate you should very on principle ignore because advocates have an axe to grind. I just point out things that are happening that I think are, have potential and where there is often all sorts of things that could be changed and improved about their context. So, for example, I don't know, fish farming. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that fish farming is a scam. But anyway, that's another thing. I think there are a lot of practical consequences of fish farming in an urban context that are practical design issues, logistical issues, where to put the water. So you have a concept which appears to have incredible resonance, which it does, and then in order for that concept to be implemented in an urban situation or a peri-urban situation, a whole excuse me, a variety of things have to be done that designers would be very good at doing. I mean, the Uber was started, well, Airbnb was started by two graphic designers who were frustrated by the cost of staying in other cities. And look, Airbnb 4 is now the biggest hotel in the world. So that's, they designed, they, they perceived an opportunity, they designed an app, they then did all sorts of stuff, got sued, you know, all sorts of learning activities that they got involved with. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I support that. I mean, the whole big data push, I understand why it's happening, because all these big consulting and technology companies perceive the city as a market that is the last kind of global market there is, because their traditional ones, part possibly from defense, are kind of disappearing. But the fact that somebody needs a market for their knowledge is not the same thing as anybody needs their service. So the, the language, do you, have, do you know the expression big data? You know about big data. So it's like a, a huge thing which sounds big and terribly helpful and sensible, except it does tends to translate into buying gigantic quantities of service and consulting time from big companies. Um, 
So I don't, it's about scales. It's not that all, everything has to be small and local. It's just that the kind of the multi-scale nature of any complex system is something that I think human beings are pretty much limited in their capacity to understand. So there are global scales of weather and all sorts of things in biodiversity that we can be aware of and therefore we need to be sensitive to without imagining that we can control them. So I think the problem that Osman has absolutely identified is that it's very tempting if you're the mayor of a city to say, well, turn it into a sort of gigantic train set in which you kind of change the, the points or the lines to stop people wasting food or to make sure everybody parks in the right place. It's just that at no point in history have cities actually behaved like that, let alone done what people told them to do. Is there a risk in, in that, though? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the examples that you gave just a minute ago of these, um, I guess, big data approaches to, well, uh, moving people around the city. So, for instance, the Uber um, or Airbnb, which is a sort of... Um, it's the, uh, isn't it another example where this thing in our pocket, this black obelisk, is, you know, it's, it's, it's sucked in music, it's sucked in journalism. Is it going to suck in hotels next and taxis? And d when, does it s when does it stop? When does this greedy data thing stop? Is it all good and local and um, but, well, I, 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 well, logical? I, or is there something, is the big data thing a bit more cynical? Well, big data is not all bad. And I, I'm, I'm so happy to have this because I've seen some people in Sydney who are sort of super fanatical about big data and going to give me a very hard time. So this is a kind of training for me. Because a lot of people think it's just the best thing since sliced bread, except that we all now know that sliced bread isn't very good for us. And I think big data <laughs> will also not be very good for us. It's not so much that it is right or wrong, it's that it triggers a misallocation of resources and energy. So the, the, the example I would use is health. So it is true that something like Cure Together or ePatient Day, one of these sites that aggregates lots of information about medical therapies, is a brilliant thing because it enables people who are sick to exchange with thousands of other people who have the same sickness what works. It's just that that is one thing. The other thing is what is the profile of the caring economy of the future in which we have to look after ourselves in better and more efficient and more caring ways. It's the therapies that we might get at through big data are like a rather tiny part of the picture. The much bigger picture is how do we get whole communities to rediscover their capacity to look after each other with, a, with older people or with people with dementia or with anything, really, children. So we've, we've medicalized and productized and serviceized so much that the big data thing is part of that world. And I actually think that our, the most of our creative energy needs to go to reanimating our collective power to look after each other rather than dreaming up some new service based on lots of data. Any more questions? Thank you, John, for, for that, asking us to re-think about the way we think about cities. I've got a question about what are your thoughts about the parts of the world that are not cities? What do we do with those? We, 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 we connect, with that. we are already connected with them. I mean, most of the world's places that are not cities are being bled dry by the cities in one way or another, either of money or of nutrition or of attention. The sort of land grabs that you've, you must have heard about that are happening now all over the world in which apparently kind of lightly populated or rural or poor or all of the above are just being bought up wholesale by agencies of people living in cities for the most part. So there's this huge thing about how are we going to feed ourselves in the future? Oh well we must buy half of Ethiopia and turn it into a farm and that's how we can feed ourselves. So in other words the country or the outside is in some way something separate and a sort of productive resource, which is how cities have grown for the last few hundred years. So I think we have to become, in cities, solidarity, make solidarity with hinterlands at least and on different scales with the people that we think are going to provide us with provisions and see what we need to do to enable them to thrive as well as us to survive. Because unless we can do it together, then we're all going to, you know, we're all going to be in a lot of trouble. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I think. Yeah. We, we might take um, one more question, and then if you've got other questions, you can come and grab John afterwards. Anybody? Oh, here we are. Yeah, just like to add a slightly positive note, because it is very easy to um, become disheartened by what we see as the possible 
um, after a obviously long and varied career I've found myself through circumstances working in a local government area with a local council in an urban situation. And I've always been, like the majority of Australians, I think pretty cynical about governments at all levels. And I must say I'm blown away by their um, dedication to making a better place to live across all forms. Um, the environment, the, uh, the ageing population, right across the week, obviously has very good management. But it's fraught with disaster uh, <laughs> because we're dealing with people and large numbers of people. Uh, for instance, I've done, I move around to all areas. Um, I did a stint in customer service, which was amazing. I had people ring up and say that the trees were dropping their leaves, <laughs> and I said... I hope you sorted that out. Uh, yes, and, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, they do drop their leaves. That's part of the amenity of the suburb you live in. Well, it's not good enough. Chop them down. Uh, um, every time there's a storm, the phone lines just run hot because people want trees chopped down because they're frightened of branches falling. Bees ring the exterminator if a hive of bees dares to stop at their house. So we, there's so many aspects of it. It, can't, it doesn't happen quickly, but it is out there. People are out there trying step by step, inch by inch, to make it a better world, to bring these local issues in and to involve people in all sorts of community environments. So it's just a little step, but it is out there, and I find it personally very hopeful. No, thank you for that. I mean, what Rory was saying a bit earlier about uh, what is always not a sort of good condition for governments to be in, so if we, if we talk about less... I th the main thing is somebody told me the trouble is that people, citizens and government people alike, think of services a bit like pizzas. You deliver the service to people and they're either satisfied or they're not, which just doesn't make sense if you're trying to look after a city or look after a garden or look after an old person. It's a collaborative, lots of people need to do lots of different things and governments, their job should, I think, be to help just make the, the collective work more effectively rather than do it to or for that old person or their family. It's just the mental model and the language of service delivery. You're delivering services from the government to the people. That language shapes expectations, and I think it makes it very hard. But I agree with you. I, I, mean, I, just, I think there's a lot of people in government at different all levels who are just frustrated by the structure of what they do rather than their motivation. It's fantastic. They don't want to do bad. Why would they? They're, very, they're just blocked. All right, well, we'd like to thank John again. <coughs>